Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Is this on? <laughs> it's good to see you. What a great crowd tonight. Look around. Wow. And, 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 and see, there's just so many that say you can't have church on Sunday night anymore, but I think this proves that wrong. Amen? Amen. All right. It's good to see you tonight. We've got uh, several announcements we're going to make, and uh, we're going to get in on into our service because we have baptism tonight. We're excited about that, and uh, it is good to see you. Chandra's got a couple announcements. Um, we have a lot of things going on with our children. We want to make sure that everybody knows about our back-to-school bash on Wednesday night starting at 5 o'clock. We'll be going from 5 to 7. They will get messy, they will get wet, and they will come home smelly. It's okay. We want you to do that too. So please, please come be a part of it. Please come get messy and wet with us. We need help and we want you to be a part of it. Uh, come to the field. We're going to get started with our field stuff about a quarter to six. I'll need some help uh, feeding them. So please, if you can help be a part of, of Wednesday night, please do that. We also have a WANA upcoming. We'll be starting to uh, talk about our WANA schedule. We'll be starting at the end of August. We want to, if you want to be a part of Awana, please see me or Drew or Mr. Ethan. Uh, and also, um, starting next week, we're going to be doing our, on Sunday nights at 5, choir one week, Bible drill one week, back and forth. So please let your kid come be a part of that with us. Also, ladies, again, if, you wanna, if you're interested in the information about Caring Kingsbury Conference coming in October, um, to First Baptist Fannin in Jackson, please get with me either tonight or, or this week sometime. I'll probably be ordering tickets by the end of the week. And I still have Shonda Pierce tickets available if you want those for November the 19th here at our church. Uh, please get with me on that. Thank you. Amen. Lots of things going on. Tuesday night, not Tuesday at lunch, but Tuesday night is the uh, Senior Citizen Monthly Meeting. It is going to be a fish fry, Senior Citizen Supper, 6.30 p.m. Don't miss this great night of fun and fellowship. Uh, Brother Matt Olson from Sharon Baptist Church will be speaking. And uh, uh, ladies, I think you're supposed to bring a dessert to go with fish, and, uh, fried fish, grilled fish, chicken tenders, and corn on the cob, and all that kind of stuff. Also, then our Bible conference, three weeks from today. It's getting close. It's, an, it's going to be an exciting time. Don't miss the Bible conference. If you have a place to, to post a poster, at a business, uh, please take one. They're on the tables around in the hallways. Please help us spread the word and invite someone to come. Three weeks from today, Dr. Sullivan will be with us. He'll preach that morning. Dr. Ted Trailer from Olive Baptist Church in Pensacola will be that night. And then on Monday night, Dr. Jeff LeBorg from uh, Tennessee, Corytown, Tennessee, just outside of Knoxville, will be with us to preach on Monday night. And then uh, Dr. Sullivan, of course, at lunch on, at the noon service on Monday as well. So don't miss out. Mark that down. And please plan to be here. I'm going to ask you to stand now and uh, fellowship those around you as the instruments play. He keeps me singing. My heart a melody, Jesus whisper sweet and low. Here not I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every I fly to worlds unknown. I shall ring with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. There is an endless song. Echo 
echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring, and though the storms may come, I am holding on to the rock I cling. How can I keep from seeing? from shouting your name. I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. Wow. This is a fantastic Sunday night crowd. Y'all didn't announce that I'm preaching tonight, did you? <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh. Oh. By the way, Tuesday night at 6.30, Cheryl will be singing and I'll be preaching at Foxworth. So if y'all don't want to go to the supper and don't mind going without supper, <laughs> come to Foxworth. Oh. You're not going to do that, but if you'll pray for us, we will appreciate it. Let's, let's go to the Lord as a church. Let's go to the Lord and pray. I'll say the words, but you pray out of your faith. Amen. Father, we come tonight in Jesus' name to thank you for this occasion. Lord, when this many people assemble in the name of Jesus, we begin to, to feel the, the hope and the possibilities are large here tonight and Lord we pray that uh, that out of this group of people that those that are really hurting would get some help tonight Father we pray that the, the glory of God the presence of God would just permeate this place in such a fashion that relief comes to the hurting. Hope comes to those in despair. Salvation comes to those that are lost. And Father, we pray tonight that the Holy Spirit of God would order our steps during the week to come. We've heard about the events ahead of us. And Lord, we pray that we would walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. God, that, that our, our walk and our talk would be consistent on Monday through Saturday with our walk and talk on Sunday. Lord, we also pray tonight for some members of our church that are in desperate need of a touch from you in the area of physical healing. Lord, I pray especially tonight for those families that are having to make hard decisions, that you'd give them wisdom as they make these decisions, that they, they won't have regrets six months from now. God, I pray also for our dear pastor as he comes to stand before us. I pray, Holy Father, that you would take him and use him like an instrument tonight that the word of God might flow from him into our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Upon your profession of faith, and Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my sister Bailey, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness and life in Christ Jesus.
upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my sister Kristen, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to be able to human baptism. <laughs> of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my sister Jason, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to be able to in baptism. Praise the walk in you this life in Christ Jesus. On your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my brother Broden, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness and life in Christ Jesus. On your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my brother Wesley, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness and life in Christ Jesus. Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my brother Braxton, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, raised from all believers in the life of Christ Jesus. <laughs> Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my brother Cullen, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism. Praise the walk in union to life in Christ Jesus. Amen. I was just noticing all the family that came in tonight for baptism. Uh, that, that speaks a lot of your families when you come in to support a loved one who's gotten saved and given the heart and watch them get baptized. So uh, as we pray as a church each night we baptize, we pray that we'll be there for them when they're on the mountaintops and whenever they're in the valleys. So I just remind us as family and friends and brothers, sisters in Christ that we do that. Good to see the great crowd tonight. Amen. There shall be showers of blessing. Let's stand as we sing our offertory hymn together. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing. Precious reviving again Over the hills and the valleys Sound of abundance of rain Showers of blessing Showers of blessing we need Mercy drops round us are falling But for the showers we Father in heaven, it is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we can approach your throne of grace. And we come tonight, Lord, praising you and thanking you so much for your blessings. Father, we just ask now that you would bless each and every one that's here, Lord. And Father, I especially ask that the ones that have been baptized, Father, that the Holy Spirit would so move about their heart, Father, that they would know that Jesus is Lord. And Father, we just pray for our uh, uh, service tonight father i just pray that you would touch the speaker that's going to be here brother brent lay upon his heart father the things that jesus would say 
And Father, I just pray that you would bless our offering tonight. And we pray this in Jesus' most precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Stephanie. So good to see you here tonight. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and open them to the third chapter of Genesis. And uh, we're going to uh, look tonight, and uh, I had a couple of different titles. I'll, I'll give them both to you, and you can choose which one you like the best. Uh, the Closed Closet of Adam uh, is one. I think that's the one I actually gave to Melissa, The Closed Closet of Adam. And uh, Genesis will be in Genesis three, 
Uh, and the other title that you can go with if you want is, I've Got You Covered. <laughs> got You Covered. I looked up the meaning. You know, you, you've heard people say, well, I've got you covered. Do you, do you know what that actual meaning is uh, when you say that to somebody, I've got you covered? The meaning is that someone is going to pay your debt. Or that someone else has taken your place. So we're looking tonight at the covering that we need. And we're going to go back to the closed closet of Adam to get some understanding and some guidance and some insight. Now, I've told you before when I was young, you know, clothes didn't mean a whole lot to me. I, I cried one year at Christmas when my grandmother gave me clothes. I needed clothes desperately, but that, ain't, that is not what I wanted. I wanted toys. And I told you about I, I found a, a, ball, a little football and a pair of pajamas, and I wanted that, and, and Mama said, those are too little. I said, I want them, I'll wear them. She said, they're too little. Well, I talked to her to buy them. That's the worst winter I've ever spent in my life. It was one of them one things. It was miserable. It was miserable. And she made me wear them the entire winter. One time, she bought me all new clothes. I went to Camp Kitty Wake, RA Camp. We down at Past Christiane. It got blown away at Hurricane Camille, but it was a great place. And they were coming to get us on Saturday morning, and I was playing ping pong. They kept saying, they're coming to get us. Come on, come on. Well, they showed up to get us, and I ran in, and I picked up my little suitcase, and I took off, and I got home. There wasn't a piece of clothes in there. She said, where are all your clothes that I just bought you? I left every one of them. My clothes closet was empty that summer. Now, we're talking about the clothes that we have that provide a covering. Now, I kind of got into this. Thank you, Lord. Kind of got into this by when we talked about Moses this morning, when he was up on Mount Sinai with the Lord, and he had spent that 40 days and 40 nights up there, and he asked the Lord, he said, I want to see your glory. <laughs> the Lord God, who is the second person of the Trinity, who he was meeting with in what we would understand to be a theophany, he was, he was come... In, in human flesh or in, in, in a covering in the likeness of man at that time. The same kind of uh, instances when he came and met a a Abraham in Genesis 18 uh, and under, the tree, under the tent at the trees of Mamre before uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Many different theophanies in the Old Testament. Um, but when Moses asked the Lord, he said, Lord, I want to see your glory. The Lord God, which we understand to be Jesus, said to him, no man can look upon my face. No man can see my glory and live. It reminds us that no flesh can glory in his presence. It just can't happen. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover you with my hand. I'll have my glory pass by. And after my glory passes by, I'll remove my hand and basically what Moses saw was the afterglow of the glory of God. That afterglow of the glory of God effective, affected Moses in such a mighty way, when he came down from Mount Sinai, his face was glowing and shining. He liked to scare the people to death. It scared them so bad that Moses had to veil his face. Now, what happened when when, when Moses had the, the, the face that shone bright after he came in contact with the afterglow of the glory of God. It'd be the same, it'd be the same understanding as what took place when Jesus went up on Mount Hermon and took with him Peter, James, and John up there. And we understand it is called the Mount of Transfiguration. The Bible says that his visage was altered and his face shone brighter than the noonday sun. As a matter of fact, it said his clothes became bright. Now what took place there? 
you're going to find out as we go through here, and, and some things that I will suggest to you that I will not emphatically say, some things I think we can infer and understand from the Scriptures that give us uh, a, a depth of understanding of what we can say. When Jesus, uh, we, we talked about this morning, he, His flesh was the veil uh, represented in the, in, the, in the tabernacle of the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. That that flesh, uh, that veil, that separating flesh was the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ and it covered the deity of Christ. Don't you let anybody ever tell you that Jesus left his deity in heaven. He did not. His, he was always God when he was here. He was God and he was man at the same time and he was covered in the humanity of flesh. Now what took place on Mount uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration is almost the same I I exact thing that had happened uh, with Moses. The very glory of God shone through the flesh of Jesus. And matter of fact, it shone through in such a way, you say, wait a minute, how did that happen? You don't think that his flesh peeled back, do you? It's not, no. The light of God shined through the flesh of Jesus. Now, you got to remember, his flesh, not like our flesh, he was in the likeness of men, but he didn't have the sin nature that you and I have. And what we're going to do, we're going to go back and find out that Adam had that same kind of light and brightness and covering that he was covered in light. Now, the light was so bright coming through Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, that it shone right through His clothes. That's a bright light. But we're, we're not talking about sunlight. We're talking about the light of God. As a matter of fact, when you read what took place on the road to Damascus with Moses, Moses said, I saw a light that was brighter than the noonday sun. Now that's a bright light. And when you read about what we're going to experience when we get to heaven, in that wonderful celestial city, we go into a place that has no need of the light of the sun because we're going to have lamb light. God's light is going to light that place. Okay? Now then, let's get back here. I've got a limited time and may not get through with this, but we, we're, going, uh, we're going to hit at it as hard as we can go uh, for just a little while. Read with me here, and we'll actually start in Genesis 2. Look at verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now we're told in chapter 1 of Genesis, and we're told even in chapter 2, that man was created in the image of God. In the image of God created he them, male and female created he them. God created man in His image. That was just not that God was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and that man was a body, soul, and spirit. That is true, but man was also in the likeness of God as you get down into the exactness of what God is talking about. This means that we were created in the likeness of God's form or His appearance. Now then... When we begin to understand that Adam, it says here, look on over into chapter, at the end of chapter 2, it says in verse 25, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. They were both naked, the man and his wife, because Adam was created in the image of God. Eve was created from the side of Adam as a helpmeet. God's crowning act of creation was Adam. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. The very presence of God in the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, was breathed into Adam. Adam was a vessel created from the dust of the ground, and he was created to contain the Spirit of God and he was given a soul separating him from all of the other animals that had been created. None of them had a soul. Adam was given a soul. Uh, the Hebrew word is the nephesh, the mind, the emotion, and the will. And so now we have 
God breathing His Spirit into Adam, and we have the statement that Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed. It does not say, and they were not covered. It says they were naked in the form that they didn't have a wool coat, they didn't have coats of skin, and they didn't have any fig leaves on them. Now we're talking about the closed closet of, of, of Adam. We're talking about the fact that he is covered. He is not naked. Now you don't think for a moment Adam and Eve are running around in the garden naked and they just got blinders over their eyes and they can't see that nakedness. Now that, you know, God doesn't tell us everything about what's in the Garden of Eden, but he doesn't make us stupid either, okay, to, to believe. And I, I've heard people say, uh, well, Adam and Eve were naked and they just didn't know they were naked. Well, good land. That makes him dumb. He was not dumb. How, you say, well, then what? He was covered with light. Did you know that our bodies, our DNA, can emit light? Scientists have, have proven that the DNA of our bodies can emit light. It's called a biophoton. Now, when you and I begin to look, it says that of God Himself, that you are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as a garment. God covers Himself with light as a garment. Psalms 102 or either 104, let me see. Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2. God is covered with light as a garment. So it stands to reason, it stands to give understanding that if Adam was created in the image of God, in the likeness of God, in the appearance of God, as God was covered in light, so was Adam. Now what does the Bible say about the angels? That they are angels of light. It says of Satan that he transforms himself into a what? An angel of light. Now the Bible says of us in the time period after we go to heaven and we receive our glorified body and we go to the judgment seat of Christ, it says that the church, the bride, to her it was granted that she should be arrayed, listen to what it says, in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And that word clean and bright there, that means radiant. It means the radiance even of the sun, the brightness of the sun. So we, as we spend eternity in the glorified bodies, we will be covered in light. Now then, but were Adam and Eve naked? They were naked in the sense that they didn't have any clothes upon themselves, but they were covered in light. They were not wearing clothes like we do today, but they were not naked in the sense that there was nothing covering them. From the text and the verbiage, we can see uh, that they were uh, absolutely covered, and I believe that without a doubt, they were covered in light. Now, I don't have time to get into it, but in chapter 3 of Genesis, we have the account of Satan coming in through the serpent into the garden and the confrontation that he has with Eve and the deception that's sown there and the fact that she takes the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and she does eat. The Bible says that Adam then takes that fruit and he does eat. Now we could, we could spend a lot of time on all the ramifications of what's taking place in that confrontation and the serpent and being a willing participant with Satan and allowing himself to be used. We could, we could go into a lot of things, but for time's sake, I'm going to have to cut through that and I'm going to have to get to what happened after they had sinned. Now the Bible tells us in Timothy in the New Testament that Eve was deceived, that Adam was not deceived. That means he sinned willfully. Now, some people will tell you that when the confrontation with Satan was going on, that Eve was in that confrontation, that Adam was standing behind, behind her, beside her, and never said a word. If that is true, he's the biggest wimp that ever lived. <laughs> Allowing his wife to come into a confrontation like that, in which he was not deceived, and never said a word, never stood up for her, never, never told her, oh, we've got to stop this. 
Now, if you think that Adam was there, that's fine. You can think that. I don't think that for a minute. You say, well, where was he? I, I don't know. The Garden of Eden, we, we're not talking about a 10-foot square little place. I mean, it, was a, it was a large place. But wherever he was, he didn't protect his bride. The Bible says that you and I as the bride of Christ, you know what? We're hidden in Christ. You know, we're hidden in a place where Satan can't get at us. Uh, Adam was given the mandate by God when he put him in the garden that you are to till it and to keep it. And when you look at that word keep, it means to guard it. Well, who was he guarding it from? He was guarding it from Satan. That's who he was guarding it from. And Satan, in his subtlety and in his cunningness and in his wiles, worked a, a scheme through the serpent to gain entrance. And a fall took place as Adam partook of that tree. Eve had already partaken. Now, I, I could talk till I'm blue in the face on the whys and why nots that Adam ate the fruit. He was not deceived. Some say, well, he ate because he saw his, the love of his life, his bride, that she had eaten, and he chose to join her. That may be. I, I don't know. Who is the one that bears the brunt of the responsibility for the sin being passed down to us? Is it Eve or is it Adam? It's Adam. It's Adam. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, For by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and thus death spread to all men, for all sinned by one man, not one woman. A lot of people want to throw off on Eve, throw off on Eve, throw off on Eve, by one man. Adam had been given the mandate by God. Adam had been given the commandment by God. Adam was the federal head of the race. Adam sinned, and his death spread to us all. His sin spread to us all. As a matter of fact, what God says, we all sinned with him and in him when he sinned. And thus death spread to all men. But then look what the Bible says. It says that after that sin had entered, it says in verse 7 of chapter 3, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So something has taken place after sin has entered in death by sin. The Spirit of God that had been breathed into the nostrils of Adam, the, the Spirit of God that had taken up residence in Adam's life, the moment he broke that command of God, the moment that Eve broke that command of God, the Spirit left them immediately. You see, when Adam walked up, he didn't have to look long at Eve to know there was something different about her. Her light covering was gone. He say, well, did, did, did Eve have to confess to Adam that she had ate, ate of the tree? No, he knew it immediately. Her covering was gone. And then he did eat. I could stand here till the, till the sun comes up in the morning and I cannot tell you why he did what he did, but I could also stand here till the sun comes up in the morning and I couldn't tell you why I've done some of the stupid things I've done either. So I'm not going to pick up stones and start throwing them at Adam because chances are, <laughs> and they're very good, that I'd have done the exact same thing. I, you know, I, 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 can't, I don't have time to get into this, and I shouldn't even mention it, but some of these uh, young earth theorists, uh, they, they say that Adam was in the garden before he sinned about an hour and 44 minutes. You say, well, where, where? well they get that in trying to get everything in in 6,000 years. Hour and 44 minutes. Do you reckon you'd have made it that long without sinning? I don't even know if I'd have made it that long. I, I don't know how long Adam was in the garden before he sinned. All I know is he broke the one commandment that God gave him. And the ramifications that come in 
are unbelievable. Not only has Eve's covering of light gone and the Holy Spirit has left her, Adam's now covering has gone and the Holy Spirit has left him. Now, now listen to me carefully. There's some things that, that happen and they become aware and some things that are uh, that need to be pointed out. It says not only did they sew fig leaves together and made themselves coverings, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said, so said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children, your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree, <coughs> of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat, it all, eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. From dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them and covered them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The first covering that Adam had, it was a covering of light. I'm dead certain of it. And I think one day too, in our glorified bodies, we will be covered in light. And it is, it is a representation of the very righteousness of God that's put forth in there, the very light of God. It's not an accident that Jesus used the analogy of light when he said to, in the, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, let your light so shine forth before men. Now, that's speaking in a spiritual realm today, but one day, in eternity, our light will shine forth. And we shall be light like God is light. Because we're going to be just like God. The Bible says God is light, in Him there is no shadow of turning. The Bible says that in Jesus, as John gives in John chapter 1, in Him was life, and the light was the light of man. It says He was the light. That's not an accident, and that's not just a, a representation that His life was bright. He is light. We saw it on the Mount of Transfiguration. You see it on the road to Damascus with Paul. You see it throughout Revelation. He is light. You see it in the, the holy city, uh, the new Jerusalem. There's no need for the sun. The Lamb's light, God's light. 
lights everything. And we will have God's light coming through us again one day. As Adam was created in the image of God and the Spirit of God came into Adam, through the way that he was created, God's light shined forth and covered him. And sin entered in death by sin, and that death spread to all men, to everyone, and that light was gone. There's a, there's a couple of things, that, three things actually that I want to mention that happened. Once Adam had sinned and the light was gone, the covering was out. First, Adam became aware of his nakedness. More importantly, he became aware of his sinfulness. He began to understand the consequences and the ramifications for breaking the one command that God had given him. He knew that he had done what God told him not to do. And he begins to become acutely aware of his sinfulness. He knew that he had disobeyed God's word. His total personality was tainted and stained by sin. No longer was the Spirit of God inside of him to guide him, to lead him, to reprove him, to give him that guidance that he needed. Now listen, every one of us in here today, we're all sinners. Some are saved sinners and some are lost sinners. But we all come from the same stock. We come from the stock of sin. Because we have a nature that causes us to sin. And those of us who are saved sinners have admitted our sinfulness to God and have chosen to turn our, from our way into God's way and turn our back on that life and reach out and ask God for forgiveness and receive His Son's gift of His shed blood offering on Calvary's cross to receive Him as our Lord and Savior and we're gloriously and marvelously saved and we can un come out from under that sinfulness that we have. Adam was under that sinfulness and he immediately knew the ramifications. He was naked. He had no covering. He knew he had to have a covering. So the first thing in the clothes closet of Adam was the covering of light that God had given him. He lost that when he sinned. And he lost it for you and me too. He lost it for all of us. But before you pick up a rock and throw it at him, I don't think you or I would have done any better. I really don't. Now, Ronnie Parkinson might have done a little better if he was up there. I don't know. If he, if he was Adam. But I don't think none of us would have really done any better. We'd all sin. Oh, I'd, I'd have made it, God. You can't make it till the morning comes up without sinning against God. Not only did he become aware of his sinfulness, he became aware of his nakedness. The light was now gone. The light was out. And then he also became aware of fearfulness. You and I live in a world that causes a lot of fear. Let me tell you something. Adam had never had one fear in his life. Can you imagine? Can you imagine living in your life and never fearful of one thing? He had never had to fear one thing. Well, what, what about the animals? He was in control of all the animals. He was in a perfect environment. He didn't have this enemy or that enemy. It, it was just him and, and, and Eve. And he was in control of everything. He was God's crowning act of creation. He walked with God in the cool of the day. The Spirit of God was in him. The covering of God's light was all around him. He never feared one thing. And now he's fearful. You say, how do you know that? He hides from God. You know why he's hiding from God? Because of fear. Now there's a lot of things that you can be fearful of today. But my Bible tells me that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Was he right to fear God? Yes, he was. Because he had disobeyed God. And now he was coming under the consequences of disobeying God. Do, do you realize there's consequences for disobeying God? 
Or do you just think that applies to somebody else? Let me tell you something. It applies to each and every one of us. Each and every one of us come under the condemnation for disobeying God. It's called God's commandments and God's law, and God takes it so seriously that he writes every sin down. And there's only one way to escape his wrath that will come about because God hates sin, and sin must be judged and sin must be punished. This fearfulness that Adam is now experiencing, he's afraid of God. Can I tell you something? You better be afraid of God too. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. Well, God's my buddy. God's, Jesus is the good old man. Listen to me. Where's your holy awe of God? You don't think he'll judge you? It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, what? The judgment. It's going to come for all of us. Adam was wise to fear God. But the steps he took that his fear drove him to were, 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 were way out of whack. What did he do? He decided to make his own covering. Now, we're not told all of what the, 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 the fruit trees of the garden were. I had somebody try to tell me all of them one time, and I thought, where are you coming up with that? <laughs> we know that there was a fig tree in the garden. How do you know that? He took some fig leaves and sewed it together. And he made, he and Eve made themselves some coverings. Now, the fig tree leaf, the covering, was good enough for Eve because he didn't hide himself from Eve, but it wasn't good enough when the Lord God showed up. You know why it wasn't good enough? Because he knew it wasn't, wasn't going to stand the test. He knew it wasn't going to wasn't going wasn't going to hang out there and be what he had before. Now your fig leaves that you've sewed up, it might be good for everybody else in here to look at you, but it's not good enough for the Lord God. He'll see right through it. Just like Adam knew. Hey, he wasn't hiding from Eve. She probably said, Adam, you look pretty good in that fig leaf there. Man, we might need to get a different color of fig leaf to go with you. You say, well, that sounds so stupid. Don't you realize most of what everybody's putting up before God is just that stupid? I come to church every week. Without Jesus in your heart, it's nothing but fig leaves. I try to do more good than I do bad. Without Jesus in your heart and you receiving him as Lord and Savior, that's nothing but fig leaves. It might be good enough for me, but it's not good enough for God. Adam knew it. Adam knew it, and you better know it too. Adam was right in one thing. He knew that to stand before a holy God, he had to be covered. So he just tried to cover himself. You know, they talk about the oldest profession in the world. Let me tell you what the oldest profession in the world is. Garment sewing. And man's still trying to garment sew his way to cover of a covering before God. And God had none of it with Adam and he'll have none of it with you. Adam comes to the understanding and the conclusion that leaves, fig leaves won't do. The Lord God comes down, he hides himself, and God calls him. Now, if there's anything that we need to stand up and applaud Adam for, when God called, he answered. Now, can I ask you a question? I know for a certainty, if you've never heard the call of God, you're hearing him tonight because the word is open, the spirit is here. And I know he's calling you out. Adam had enough sense to answer when God called him. Do you have that? There's a lot of things we could fault Adam for in what's taking place here. But when God called, he answered. Have you answered the call of God? 
God calls you to salvation. He also calls you to service. Have you answered the call? Adam did. Here, here I am, Lord. What is this you've done? He begins to blame the woman you gave me, Eve. He said, what would you do, woman, Eve? The serpent beguiled me. They both confessed, no, I, I ate. You've got to come to the point when God calls you to confess up. It's not my mama, it's not my sister, it's me, oh Lord. It's me. I did it. I sinned. I'm guilty. The first garment that Adam had was a beautiful and glorious covering of light. He lost that. It's gone. The second garment was some old fig leaves. That wouldn't do. The third garment. The Bible says that God, the Lord God, made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now, up until this time, not one animal had ever died that was under Adam's care. Not one. The Bible also says that he had named every animal. You say, which animal died here for these tunics of skin? God doesn't tell us. I would, I would think it's a lamb, but I, I don't know. God has what's an acceptable sacrifice and what is not. All of us can get close to an animal. An animal that Adam had cared for, he had named, he had watched. Why, why did, he might have said, Lord, why don't you just take and shear the wool and make the coverings from the wool you shear? And the Lord God would have said, well, the problem with that, Adam, is there's no bloodshed. You see, Adam without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sin sin your sin requires death now the death of this animal right here and I'm going to use the, the skin to cover your outward nakedness but more important I'm going to use it to cover your inward spiritual nakedness through its blood it's just a covering because see the blood of bulls and goats won't satisfy my father. A man sinned, a man's got to die. And I think he even told Adam, one day I'm coming. In the fullness of time, God's going to send me forth, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to come as a man. And I'm going to die in your place. I'm going to die in your place for what you just did. Don't you imagine Adam hung his head? I think he did. I think there was tears rolling down his face. Not only did that animal have to die for me, but God, you're going to have to die for me. Yeah. And he died for all of us. Adam left there that day with the profound knowledge that sin has consequences and that the wages of sin is death but he was covered and somebody paid his debt and somebody took his place. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for your precious word. Thank you for your love and your mercy and grace. Thank you that you were willing to send your son to take our place in death, to die our death that we might have forgiveness of sin. We, as Adam, have lost our covering of innocence. We've lost our covering to stand before you, but thanks be to God that your Son is providing His righteousness to cover us. And Father, I pray now that during this time of invitation, not one person would leave here without knowing that they know that they know Jesus is Lord and Savior. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together as Eric leads us in this hymn. You respond as the Lord is leading in your life. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's 
light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over us sin no more hath dominion for more than conquerors we And all God's people said, Sometimes we get the cart ahead of the horse. <laughs> Jancy got baptized a while ago. She's been saved, but we've never presented her to our church as a member. So we're going to do that now. What's the mind of our body in receiving Jancy Holofield, who's, who's asked Jesus into her heart? JC. Troy told me Jancy. That's his fault. J.C. I knew, I knew that. J.C. Holyfield is right here. I'm not going to listen to what Troy says no more. What's the mind of our body in receiving J.C. Holyfield as she has asked Christ into her heart and seeks membership in our church family? All that we're both that way, let's do so by saying I. We'll be dismissed here in just a few moments, and uh, you'll want to come and give to this young fine girl that Troy doesn't know her name <laughs> the right hand of Christian fellowship now we're going to have uh, prayer I'm going to lead us in prayer we've got some people that we want to pray for if you want to come to the altar and pray for them that'll be fine um, uh, BK Ford is having valve replacement mitra valve placement uh, heart, uh, heart mitra valve replacement in Jackson in the morning Lindsay Graves is having uh, colon resuscitation in Hattiesburg in the morning. Libby Welch is going in uh, for uh, a heart procedure that she might be in the, heart, in the hospital for a couple of days. And Jim Elsey's in the hospital. He's getting lower and lower and lower um, by the day. And uh, there's not a whole lot they're going to be able to do for him. Yeah. George Hill had a, uh, another light stroke um, a week ago, Friday, Thursday, and he can't speak now. They're hoping that his speech will come back, but now he can't speak. So let's, let's remember George. So if you want to come and pray and gather around, you can pray right where you are. I'll lead this prayer. Um, we, we believe in coming uh, to the altar. We believe in lifting our people up, and we've got some that we want to pray for and uh, pray that God would uh, be with them in, in a mighty way through these procedures. Two, three are going in tomorrow. Jim's already in the hospital. So let's remember them as we pray. Tony West went to the um, emergency room. He was feeling terrible this morning, and he texted me right before the service. He's got pneumonia. So let's remember Tony also. Yes, sir. Uh, Sharon texted me this morning. Billy Ray, they had pulled the fluid off his lungs, and he decided to stay home one more week, but he plans to come next week, but he still needs our prayers. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you guys for being here tonight. Father, we are so thankful that uh, we've seen these baptismal waters stirred and these lives that have given their heart to Jesus have, without, without any fear, have come forward and 
professed that Christ is their Savior, and they've entered the baptismal waters to give a demonstration of showing what has taken place on the inward, uh, they now want to see moving to the outward side of their life as they've given their heart to Christ. We pray that we as a church would guide them and gird them and disciple them and lead them into the way you would have them to lead their lives as believers. And we thank you for each one of them. Father, for these that are in our church family that need your prayer, we do pray for Jim Elsie. He's lived a long and faithful life in service to you. He's taught your word. He's been unashamed in his faith. And Father, we thank you for him. I lift him up to you. I pray that you be gracious to him. And I pray for his dear wife, Mr. Morris. I know that uh, she's having some dementia problems, and we lift her up to you, and we pray you'd bless her. We lift that entire family to you. And Father, we pray for Lindsey Graves. We know he's had such a tough time these last few months. We pray you'd bless him as he goes to surgery one more time tomorrow for his colon resuscitation. We pray you'd be with him and bless him in a mighty way through it. We pray for Libby Welch as she'll be going in uh, for uh, the, the medication she'll take for her heart and pray that, that that would be very successful. We do pray for Billy Ray and Sharon Taylor. We ask you to continue to bless them and we lift them up. We pray for BK, Father, as she'll have the procedure to fix the, the leaky valve in her heart, that mitral valve. We pray for a very successful surgery. We pray your hand be with her and uh, as she undergoes that, we pray for a very speedy recovery for this young girl. We pray that we lift her up to you, and we pray you'd bless her. Father, I know there are lots of others that, that need your blessings. We pray for Tony West. We pray you'd bless him. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for covering us and paying our debt, taking our place. And we thank you for your son. I thank you for each person that's come this night. I pray all these things in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen. Jesse, if you would come stand.